Well, we've already discussed the uh, the migration of Buddhism into the uh, into some of them to the uh, eastern countries. Um, Buddhism originated in India, and it has become an Asian religion for all intents and purposes. It's uh, it's, it's greatest. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it has flourished uh, most most uh, happily in the countries of Asia, uh, particularly China and uh, Japan. Uh, it was transmitted to, uh, to China, and uh, around the uh, third century BC, and uh, it evolved uh, there, and uh, it combined with uh, with Taoism, which is the indigenous form of uh, uh, religion, combined with Taoism to become uh, what is called uh, Chan, Chan Buddhism. Flourishing 
that's related to the word uh, vigorous. So uh, it's not, it doesn't have, a, a, it's not directly linked with, with vegetable. Uh, vegetable and vegetarian have the same root word. They can be both tra traced back to the same etymology, but they are not uh, uh, directly related, indirectly related. Uh, so the Pythagoreans derive from, from uh, probably Jainism. Uh, and as, as we move from, uh, from India back to the East, the first uh, vegetarian religion in, uh, in China was um, Taoism. Taoism was founded by a, uh, a man uh, whose name was Lao Tzu.
to discover the Indian uh, the Indian elements in the, in the Tao Te Ching was a, was a scholar by the name of Arthur Whaley in the 1920s. He, he wrote a, a book called The Way and Its Power. Uh, the Tao means the way. Uh, and his, according to his analysis, the Tao Te Ching is actually a disguised handbook of yoga. Uh, and it's a, it teaches a form of yoga to the, uh, to, the uh, to the monarch, to the king, the ruler. It was, it was addressed to the ruler of a kingdom. And uh, it was hoped that the, the ruler, the prince, somewhat like uh, Machiavelli is the prince, Except uh, instead of urging uh, warfare, he urges, uh, Lhasa urges uh, that the prince uh, withdraw from, from the battlefield, that he retreat uh, into himself and perform uh, calisthenics, breathing exercises, uh, meditation. Uh, in other words, the Indic art of yoga. Uh, so in other, he was prescribing uh, an early form of yoga and also a vegetarian diet for the prince, and that he believed that the prince would become a, a very esteemed ruler if he could put these principles into interaction. Uh, so uh, lots of uh, the Chinese are uh, have always been interested in uh, in longevity, prolonging their lives. It's believed that. Of the, the, the best state of life. Uh, they actually, until recently, I suppose, until the Western influence began to set in, it was believed that the most desirable time of life was in, was old age. And that people actually looked forward to aging. Uh, and if they would lie about their age, they would add years to their age instead of subtracting years. Uh, so, and if, if people would be congratulated uh, on their gray hair, and if they would bald, prematurely bald, this was considered a sign of great uh, benevolence. And uh, instead of wearing toupees, uh, people would, would try to lose their hair look, and age because um, it was a very, uh, it was, uh, people in old age are highly venerated and uh, given great honor in Chinese society. So uh, if, and if anything, they would like to live forever. They've always, there's always been this desire for longevity in China. And the Tao Te Ching is a, is a document which aids in uh, prolonging life by the practice of yoga through, through uh, the practice of an ascetic diet. So uh, the Tao Te Ching is really a, a, the, probably the first document that appealed to the, the health interest of the vegetarian, of the, uh, the health interest of vegetarianism, of following the vegetarian diet. Uh, the Pythagoreans in the West uh, were, were influenced by the, uh, the humane ethos where, and uh, by the idea of reincarnation and uh, ahimsa. But the Chinese were more uh, admired uh, the Jain ideas of yoga and, and vegetarianism uh, and ahimsa for their life-prolonging uh, powers. Uh, so uh, he, he was appealing to the uh, uh, to the, the vanity in, in the Chinese to, to live forever, uh, and the Taoism has remained a, a vegetarian religion for the most part throughout uh, throughout its history. Uh, many of the societies, vegetarian societies in Hong Kong today, uh, vegetarian restaurants are run run by the Taoist uh, organizations. Uh, even in China itself, uh, uh, they went underground during the Maoist uh, regime, but uh, they continued to flourish. Uh, and uh, the lay vegetarian societies in China were sponsored by the Taoists. Uh, the monasteries, the, the monasteries before before uh, the uh, China, Chinese Revolution, before the Communist Revolution, were uh, the Taoist monasteries were uh, were vegetarian. We're all vegetarian, as it were, the Buddhist monastery. So, so uh, Taoism is uh, one of the great, uh, the great vegetarian religions of Asia. It's uh, like Jainism. It's very little known in the in the uh, in the West. Uh, and it's more and more is being learned about it. Uh, but the Tao Te Ching is one of the most widely translated books in the West, uh, and. Uh, uh, 
it's it's sell it's it's a bestseller. I mean, whenever it's retranslated, it becomes an instant bestseller, and people are are fascinated by it. Uh, the Taoist uh, uh, there are Taoist uh, magicians uh, as if, uh, performed of uh, tried to to supply the court the court with uh, with elixirs and life prolonging uh, substances, along with the vegetarian. They would put their the rulers on a vegetarian diet. And many of the Chinese uh, <coughs> rulers would have Taoist uh, priests advising them on how to live longer. Uh, unfortunately, many of them, and they were very eager to, to take whatever they was offered. And uh, so the, the, the Taoist priests would, uh, uh, were so anxious to please the, uh, the, uh, the emperors that they would often come up with things that uh, were poisonous. And the emperors were so eager to prolong their lives that they would uh, they would swallow any pill that was offered up, very much like Westerners today, I guess. <laughs> and some of them were, were carried off by these, uh, these supposed elixirs. Uh, but the Taoists, uh, uh, they, they have this, this religious tradition, as well as the tradition of alchemy and, and magic. Uh, the religious tradition uh, influenced Buddhism, and uh, it uh, Practice to him, although it grew out of it grew out of health concerns, uh, as many people you know who become vegetarians for health really reasons evolve into ethical vegetarians. Taoism evolved into an ethical religion as well, and uh, so in the Taoist monasteries, for example, pr uh, prior to the, uh, the revolution in China, the uh, the monks were very. Uh, very much like the uh, the monks of the Buddhist monks or the Jain monks in India, and they were very concerned about animal issues, and uh, uh, it wasn't for health reasons alone that they were vegetarians. Uh, it, apparently, the the, da the, the Taoist uh, regime was quite uh, was quite effective because the monks were were noted for their longevity in the monasteries, and uh, they were actually vegan. So the Chinese have. Uh, Vegetarian, the Chinese have never uh, consumed dairy products. Uh, they have, uh, many of them have lactose intolerances, and uh, they consider uh, they consider dairy products to be a barbaric uh, food. Uh, so it, milk has never made any uh, inroads in, into Chinese culture, and the vegetarians uh, in, in China have always been uh, vegans. Uh, and the Taoist uh, the monks in the Taoist monasteries were. Uh, famous for their uh, just tremendous stamina, and they could uh, perform the, the feats of uh, much younger men. And uh, this was also uh, an appeal. It's also appealed to the uh, to the interests of uh, the health interests of the Chinese, as well as to their compassionate interests. But it must be said that the Chinese were not as compassionate as the as the Indians or as the uh, as the, the, the early Greeks. The Pythagoreans. Taoism uh, 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 continues to, to exist and it's making making a comeback in China. Uh, they're restoring the monasteries there, and uh, there are many restaurants in uh, throughout China, cities now that are uh, uh, being revived, and they serve Taoist cuisine, which is strictly vegetarian. Uh, they have the most delicious cuisine, actually, in China. And if you go to Peking, for example, you can eat in Taoist restaurants and, and the major major cities throughout China. And now that the monasteries are being uh, restored, uh, it will be possible to visit Taoist monasteries and uh, uh, sample the temple food there. Uh, Taoism combined uh, with Buddhism in China uh, and uh, to, to, form, to form a sort of hybrid religion called Chan Buddhism. Uh, Chan Buddhism uh, was, then, was then exported from uh, China to Japan in, the, uh, in about the fifth century AD. It arrived in China, Japan. Uh, Buddhism having having been uh, filtered through Taoism, so it was a new form of uh, a new form of Buddhism, and they uh, the Japanese called it Zen Zen Buddhism. Um, 
one of the, the contributions that Taoism made to, uh, to, to Buddhism was the, was, the, was the famous koan, the idea of, of riddles, of, uh, of stimulating with mystical fact, faculties by, by posing uh, riddles such as what is the sound of one hand clapping, the famous Buddhist, the Zen Buddhist koans, that I'm sure you're familiar with. Uh, these have come out of Taoism, actually, and they are uh, used in Buddhism to concentrate the mind uh, and to uh, stimulate the mystical faculties. Uh, so uh, Buddhism, Zen Buddhism acquired many of the uh, uh, trappings of Taoism, uh, and uh, they, it was taken over into Japan, and uh, along with uh, Taoism, uh, arrived, I mean, along with Zen Buddhism, also arrived the technique for making uh, tofu, this a new dish called soybean, soybean, soybean curds, which had never been tasted in Japan. Uh, the technique of making uh, soybean curds, of curdling, of using soybeans and making this dish called tofu, uh, was actually imported, arrived in Japan, uh, along with uh, Zen Buddhism. The priests and the uh, the Taoist priests had always had used uh, soybean curds, and uh, the Buddhists had learned it from them, and they were bringing it over to uh, to Japan. And uh, as Buddhism spread throughout Japan, so did the practice of uh, of making soy foods. Uh, so Japan has become perhaps one of the largest consumers of uh, of soy foods. And they have they have invented their own. Uh, strains of, uh, of soy foods, and uh, so this is one of the concomitants of, of Buddhism now. And it's interesting that uh, now that uh, Buddhism uh, is spreading to the West, the first, the first person to, uh, to bring uh, soy foods to the West, uh, to introduce the West to soy foods, was a man by the name of William Shirtliff in the 1970s, and he's trained in Japan as a Zen monk. And he, he learned the art of uh, tofu making while he was in Japan. Uh, he said he worked in the, uh, in the kitchen, monastery kitchen, and he married a Japanese, uh, a Japanese artist uh, uh, named Akiko. And uh, she taught him the family recipes and for, for tofu. And uh, I'm sure that wasn't his reason for marrying her, but uh, he did acquire <laughs> a lot of recipes for tofu. And they collaborated on that. Book, the first this book that introduced uh, to tofu making on a grand scale to the West, called the Book of Tofu, in 19, uh, was published in uh, I think, believe 1974. And uh, prior to that time, uh, tofu had never, uh, I mean, it, it had been served in the West in Chinese restaurants, but it had not en entered the consciousness of uh, the average Westerner. But now it's in all the supermarkets and the health food store. And the it's ubiquitous, and we owe this all to uh, to Shirtliff, and actually, by way of to to Buddhism, to Zen Buddhism, and back to Taoism. So I think it's also uh, it also heralds the the coming to America of, uh, of Buddhism, of Zen Buddhism, and uh, the Zen monasteries are, are proliferating throughout uh, throughout the United States. Uh, the first uh, Zendo in America was established by. Uh, by a man named Roshi Kaplow, Philip Kaplow, who uh, had uh, was a court reporter, who had served as a court, uh, studied to be a court reporter in the United States, and had he was an, such an excellent reporter that he was invited to Nuremberg to cover the Nuremberg trials, and then he uh, subsequently went to Japan to to uh, to record the uh, the proceedings at the the Japanese war crimes trials uh, when they tried. To Tojo, and uh, so he was there at that time. And during the during the uh, trial, he uh, he learned that Tojo, the Japanese, uh, the architect of the Japanese uh, the uh, Japanese uh, military buildup, had actually had studied Zen with, uh, with one of the great Zen masters in, uh, in Japan. His name was uh, D.T. Suzuki, and uh, so Philip Kaplow uh, wanted to meet. Uh, he heard that that. Uh, Suzuki was living not far from the from the site of the war crimes trial in Tokyo, so he, he met uh, Suzuki and he was very impressed with him. And he, he gave up his uh, 
his court reporting to become a Zen monk. He gave it all up. Uh, he moved to Japan, entered the monasteries, and uh, became a vegetarian eventually. Uh, at this time, the, uh, it was before the westernization had set in to, to the extent that it has now, and uh, everyone uh, in the monasteries was vegetarian. And uh, so he gradually converted and uh, studied, studied there for about uh, nine years. And then he returned to America and established the first Zen monastery in Rochester, New York, the first vegetarian Zen monastery, I should say. Uh, and uh, he also, curiously enough, he's, he also started a tofu company, which is sort of, a, as I said, a concomitant of Zen, of the arrival of Buddhism in the West. And, uh, so uh, this, this is an example of how uh, Eastern religions have traveled uh, from, uh, from, uh, from India to uh, China, to Japan, and to America by the Pacific route. Uh, so we have it coming. Uh, Indian religions, the influence of Indic religions are uh, reaching us uh, by a Pacific route and by, by also directly from uh, from India and in the East uh, to the West, I should say. Uh, we, get, we also get it from the Pythagorean influence, uh, the classical antiquity. Uh, and we're getting it now from, uh, directly from India. So uh, it seems to be coming at us from all directions. Does anyone have any questions? Are the Zen Buddhists in America vegetarians? Uh, many of them are. I, get, I can't say that they all are, but uh, Roshi Kaplow was the first, uh, actually there had been monasteries established in California prior to Roshi Kaplow's founding of the, of the Rochester Zen Center. But these were not uh, vegetarian. Uh, these were actually founded by Japanese uh, Roshis, but they, they had been uh, westernized and uh, they were meat eaters. Uh, but Roshi Kaplow uh, was, uh, founded his monastery, in the, uh, his temple I should say, in the uh, Zendo in the 60s. Uh, at that time, it was a very idealistic period, and people were ready to, to hear this message. And, uh, so they, uh, they took to it, and uh, it began to uh, flourish. And uh, uh, Kaplow has written a number of books on Zen, uh, introdu Introduction to Zen, and some very scholarly studies. The Three Pillars of Zen is one of the classics of uh, modern uh, Zen American literature. And, uh, he also wrote a book called To Cherish All Life. I think it's out of, I think it's on sale actually in the bookstore, To Cherish All Life, which you should look, I commend to you. It's a, a study of the first, the Buddhist first precept. He re-examines the pre first precept of Buddhism. And uh, so uh, that's an example of how everything has come around. And, uh, Kaplow has had an enormous influence on the other Zendos. And he himself has found it Zendos through, uh, throughout the country and in Eastern Europe uh, and Europe. I think he's about, uh, founded 12, 12 temp Zen temp Zendos throughout the world. Uh, one in Santa Fe, I think, uh, and a few others. And he travels widely, so he's, he's exerted an enormous influence on dietary practices within the, uh, the Zen monasteries in America. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. Transmigration. Yeah. yeah. Was that referring to just the Hindu religions, or is that all the religions that come across that involve vegetarianism? Are they all involved in the incarnation? Yes, yes, they all, all seem to have incorporated that, uh, that doctrine of re reincarnation. That's why I say it's also becoming popular in the West now, the, the sole notion of, of reincarnation. You know, Shirley MacLaine uh, has popularized it in her writings, and everyone's, you know, discussing it, what, 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 what might I have been in my last lifetime or something, what will I be? People are much more conscious of the idea, so it may be entering the, uh, the Western consciousness, I think it's, and I think it's a sign that we're progressing towards a vegetarian ethos in the West, the idea of, you know, the fact that reincarnationism is beginning to impress itself on our, on our thinking.
Well, I mentioned that earlier. I think Christianity also had, was, when it was a vegetarian religion, when it was an Essene religion, it was also a re reincarnative religion. Uh, uh, vegetarianism and reincarnation, reincarnationism went out of Christianity at about the same time, when it was abolished by the Nicene Council. Uh, then it, didn't, it was no longer a vegetarian religion. Uh, why is it? It's because, uh, I, think, I think it's because when uh, you realize that uh, a relative or a friend may be incarnated in the body of an animal, you're much less apt to want to eat it if you firmly believe it. Uh, and you yourself uh, would, would not look forward to being reincarnated as a cow if you thought you were going to be milked and butchered. Uh, so that does operate to, uh, to inhibit uh, uh, carnivorism, I think. And that's, I think before we, we were going to have to incorporate it in our religious system somehow, before we become vegetarians. That seems to be the hallmark of uh, vegetarianism. Yes? Uh, you, you were coming a while back about the excellent Chinese food, vegetarian food. Yes. Uh, what about the practice of using human excrement as a fertilizer? I understand that that has been done. Well, if it's vegetarian excrement, perhaps it's very tasty. I don't know. <laughs> well, To be what? Well, I don't know. I mean, maybe they should have, because uh, the, the North Vietnamese were, were subsisting on a vegetarian diet, and they, they seem to have outformed the Americans. So. The Japanese also subsisted on a vegetarian diet, you know, rice, a few uh, grams of rice a day, and omoboshi plum, and look up for a middle. Perhaps if the American soldiers had adopted a low cholesterol diet, they might have fared better in the war. If they had eaten those vegetables, which supposedly were grown from human excrement, they might have done better. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. I've heard doctors say that uh, it's possible well, human excrement should be um, treated environmentally and it can be yeah, sure. to be used for um, for gardens. Why not? It's no different from animal yeah. uh, you know, animal excrement that you know, from animals that have been uh, that are vegetarian and have not been injected with uh, chemicals and uh, so forth. It's perfectly good. It's fertilizer. Yeah. Yes? One of the interesting principles of Chinese cooking, and particularly stir fry, is to sear the out, outer part of the vegetable so you destroy uh -huh. any parasites that may be remaining. They also boil all their water. And uh -huh. By using those two principles, they avoid uh, uh, the transmission of infectious diseases that could arise. Interesting point. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I just have a general question about uh, the sky god religions. Oh yes. Yeah. Sky god religion. And when, from from your reading, was that uh, instituted, and why, and what was the rationale for? for well, the uh, worshippers of the sky god religions were. Uh, the nomadic uh, peoples, the Aryans, well, they call themselves Aryans, which meant uh, the, the people, actually, Arias means the people. And, uh, it's, it's actually become the root of the word aristocrat, the best. They believe that they were the best. Again, yeah, this is our, our word aristocrat, and our word Ares, the god of war, comes from Arian. Uh, so these were the uh, people, they were driven by lust for territory and uh, conquest. and. Uh, like most meat eaters, they always want more, and you know, they're insatiable. So that's what uh, drove them to invade these these, uh, these countries, and they enslaved the peoples there and imposed their religions. Yes. Could you describe that uh, food you were talking about? This delicious food in the Dallas restaurant. Uh, well, it's sort of the temple cuisine that they use. Uh, I. Uh, I can't think of any recipes offhand, but they use a uh, uh, very, you know, delicious uh, ingredients and uh, oils. Uh, uh, sesame oil is one of the chief ingredients, so it imparts a very uh, pleasant flavor to, to the food. And uh, they also use a lot of uh, 
uh, tofu and uh, soy foods and uh, mock meats and that sort of thing. And uh, they just have a way of doing it. I, I wish I could duplicate it. <laughs> but uh, they do use a lot of uh, sesame oil and uh, uh, ginger and uh, you know, most of it. Uh, I'm not a great chef, so I can't. Uh, not a lot. Yes. Since then, they've fallen away from their uh, strict vegetarianism. Nothing in the Pre-Columbian. Well, I'm sure there were uh, vegetarian uh, groups among them, but their history has been lost. And, you know, we can't. I'm sure men were perhaps uh, predominant, uh, predominantly vegetarian. Even the Indians didn't eat that much meat. I mean, uh, they weren't vegetarians, but they ate very little meat. Or they only ate meat to. Um, on religious occasions, just as uh, in antiquity, they, they, uh, most people in the ancient world did not eat meat uh, on a very large scale, except on, uh, on religious uh, occasions. Uh, not, certainly not, only the aristocrats uh, would eat meat on the scale of what we do in this country or in Western Europe. Uh, uh, any other questions? Yes? Sell at making all these mock meats, which are both the Buddhist and Taoist chefs seem to enjoy mimicking the, uh, the flesh, you know, the flesh, animal flesh with, uh, with wheat gluten and uh, soy foods, and uh, they're really quite uh, expert at it. Yes? Do they try to pass it off as the real thing or are they up front about it? No, no, the, the, because people know when they go to these restaurants that they won't get any meat. So, but they, uh, but for some reason, they uh, they seem to delight in doing it. It's just, it just seems to be a challenge to their prowess as cooks or something. <laughs> I guess that's it. Thank you very much for coming.